Hey everybody and welcome back to another fan commentary for a Resident Evil movie. This time we're going to talk about the fourth film in the franchise called Resident Evil Afterlife. I have not started the movie yet, so if you're here listening and you want to watch or listen along while the movie's playing, uh, feel free to just wait for a minute. I'll give you the signal. We'll do a 3, 2, 1 countdown and I'll tell you when to hit play. So right now I'm just on the main menu watching kind of the graphics moving around and stuff. And I have the, you know, the cursor over the play movie button, but we're not going to press it just yet. I'll do a countdown before we get there. There will be things I talk about in this movie that will make it sound like I like the movie, and I just want to be upfront and say that I don't really like this movie at all. Um, I will say, though, it has, the, I guess, um, a lot of characters from the video game in it and a lot of my favorite characters. So that's why I have a guilty pleasure interest in this movie, but I don't like this movie. In fact, uh, there's so many things in this movie that contradict the previous movies, and there's a lot of things in this that just don't make sense creatively, like why you would do certain things. And obviously we're going to go over those. And these are, of course, my opinions. If you ever have a different opinion to me on, you know, something like this, please let me know in the comments. Uh, you know, how do you feel about Resident Evil Afterlife? Are you a fan? Are you not a fan? Feel free to listen to my whole commentary first before you comment if you'd like, or, you know, uh, comment as you, you know, listen along. Uh, usually when I do these, I'll look for people who do these fan commentaries online and I'll put them, you know, have a headset plugged into my phone and I'll play the movie and I'll have the volume on low and I'll have the, uh, you know, my phone playing the podcast or the commentary. And, uh, and that usually is just my kind of like low tech way of <laughs> my more direct way, I guess, of doing it. So, um, so, you know, feel free to do that if you want, and you can listen to me ramble about this movie and talk about some stuff. I know some behind the scenes of this movie, some stories, but not a ton. Um, not like I do like the first movie, for example, and maybe some of the second movie. So I know a little bit less about the behind the scenes stuff on this. So I would encourage you, if you are a fan of these movies and you want to know that stuff, please go get the DVDs, watch them with the commentaries. Paul W. Sanderson usually does at least one commentary track for these movies, if not two sometimes, uh, depending on the Blu-ray, DVD, whatever combo you get. Um, so I would encourage you to, to do that yourself and hear it directly from the filmmaker's mouths of, uh, of how they did things and what they worked on and what they were trying to accomplish. This is obviously a fan commentary, and this is just giving you my perspective of the film and, uh, and talking a little bit about the differences and similarities between the films and the games and other you know, parts of the Resident Evil franchise. So without further ado, we're going to get started here. Um, go ahead and get ready. Uh, put your cursor over the play movie. And like I said, as we go through the movie, we'll talk, I'll tell you about each scene and we'll talk about different things and creatures and monsters and my experience with uh, some things that revolve around the marketing of this movie, um, you know, trying to go to conventions and stuff uh, to, you know, to be a part of it. But also this movie came out the year I had my brain aneurysm in 2010. So, um, you know, there was a, a lot of, uh, there, it gets, it gets fuzzy. I, you know, this is definitely 2010 is a, is kind of a rough year. Probably the best memories I have of it is when I was recovering back in South Carolina and being around my, my friends and my mom and stuff again. Um, so, uh, so maybe some of that will come into this. Maybe some of it won't, I don't know. Uh, I'm just going to kind of go off the cuff here and just kind of have fun and, and talk during this movie. So hopefully you guys learn at least a thing or two from me. But like I said, if you want to learn more, go check out the Blu-ray or DVD yourself and listen to, uh, to the movie with the commentary from the filmmakers. Uh, that's probably the probably the best way to you know experience this movie uh, or these movies is here from the filmmakers themselves. But if you're a fan like me and you just want to hear another fan's perspective, then let's get ready. We have the movie and we're going to hit it here in three, two, one, and play. So now we have the blue title screen up that says uh, rated R. And uh, so that's where we're at right now. And the movie, we got the FBI warning and all that stuff. Um, so I, and I, every once in a while you might hear me talk about the scene that's on screen so that way you know kind of where we are in the movie in case like we you know separate you know in case uh you don't have the same intro i do or whatever maybe you have a digital copy of this and it played right away you know whatever so i try to mention things that i'm seeing on screen sometimes so that way you can uh, make sure we're synced up still and sometimes we get audio drifts uh and that stuff too so here we have screen gems their logo popping up in red here. Screen Gems actually paid Davis Films and Constantin Films, who were the people who owned the rights for Resident Evil and made this movie. They made this movie with a budget of $60 million. Most of the Resident Evil movies were like between 40 and 60 million. And Screen Gems actually paid Constantin and Davis Films $52 million to distribute this movie in the US and in other countries. So I don't really know actually how the financing works on that side of movies 
So I don't know if that means they pretty much made their budget back or not. <laughs> I, I don't know because I, I imagine they had to go get investors and other people to help with the pay for the $60 million budget. So that could have been it. Could have just been like, hey, Screen Gems is going to pay us 52 out of our $60 million budget to make this. Could have been that. I don't know. I don't know how the financing works, but it sounds like they made their, their budget back pretty quickly <laughs> to me. But I, again, I could be wrong there. Uh, so we have Milijovic's name that just popped up and Ali Larder. And this is shot, it's supposed to be Tokyo. It's not shot in Tokyo, obviously, but it's, um, uh, now I'm blanking on the place it's uh, named after, <laughs> uh, Shibuya Square, I believe, um, Shibuya Crossing. It's like this very busy intersection in Tokyo. And uh, and they shot this movie with James Cameron's 3D camera. I think it's called like the Sony F35 or something like that, or F19. I can't remember what it's what the code name for was or the technical code name for it is. Um, but I guess Paul W. Sanderson. They originally were not going to make this movie. They they said nope. Third one was the last one, and we're ready to walk away. Even though Paul W. Sanderson only wrote and directed the first Resident Evil, he did write and produce the second and third one. But I guess he was done with it. He wanted to go off and make an Alien vs. Predator franchise, which didn't do that well. Um, and he wanted to go off and do other things, remake Death Race or whatever it was, 2000. Um, and so he kind of just kind of started doing other projects. Well, Sony was like, hey, this last movie, the third one, made us some money and we would like to keep this going. And you ended on a cliffhanger anyway. And that's my issue with Paul W. Sanderson. He was willing to just walk away from Resident Evil 3 uh, or Extinction with the movie ending with Alice and a bunch of clones ready to go take on Umbrella. And that would have been frustrating for me because even though I don't love these movies, it would have been the second time that we don't see a battle actually brought to Umbrella. In the first Resident Evil games, like the first three and Code Veronica, each game ends with the heroes going, we have to stop Umbrella. We got to take down Umbrella. You know, they're the ones behind this. We got to take them down. And, uh, and then in the fourth game, Umbrella's already taken down because their stock prices dropped. And I thought that was so anticlimactic and boring. So if the third movie just ended before Umbrella got taken down, I probably would have hated it even more than I already do. <laughs> but this movie kind of, that's why it's a guilty pleasure. It a little bit redeems that. You actually see Alice bring the fight to Umbrella in this. And you see Umbrella has a leader in this. It's not Spencer, Oswald Spencer from the games, but it's actually Albert Wesker, who is a definite, definite fan favorite. And here we're seeing uh, this unnecessarily long slow-mo shot just because Paul W. Sanderson likes to, <clears throat> you know, waste his time and money. Uh, that was a long, long scene to have someone instantly turn into a zombie. That's not how it works. People don't instantly turn into zombies. They've already established that in previous movies, but they're trying to say that this young lady here was patient zero of the Tokyo outbreak, um, which means, okay, so there was a, a second outbreak other than Raccoon City. So Raccoon City happened, and then, but now the virus came from, but then it was nuked, but the virus still got out. And so I, it's it's so confusingly stupid. Um, and now we have another voiceover from Alice. And look at this. There's water on the planet. There's all these all these things that the last movie said would were going to be dead. The last movie made it very clear that water and lakes and oceans dried up. Um and that uh, uh, ice cube, or, uh, you know, ice, um, I guess ice cubes, <laughs> um, the, like ice melted all over the planet. Um, the, like I said, lakes and everything dried up, plants dried up and died and withered away. But yeah, this movie, you're going to see a ton of plants. You're going to see um, a ton of water, a ton of glaciers uh, and ice. So um, yeah, it's, it's just like a, always a contradiction and this apparently takes place a year after the the um the last movie um this him saying uh, biohazard that's what it's called in japan resident evil's japanese name is biohazard um so uh so i guess uh, paul anderson loves doing things like that like little Easter eggs like that, which sometimes are fine. I'm not, I'm not against. And sometimes I, it gets, it, they're goofy. Um, and we'll talk about some of that with the casting of, of Chris Redfield when that pops up later. Uh, but then you have this scene here where it's like 
there's umbrella guards on buildings surrounding Shibuya because there's a secret entrance um, underneath Shibuya Square to a umbrella lab. <laughs> and look how big and obnoxiously stupid this lab looks. Um, just like the one in the first movie. It's like, um, like umbrella was already the richest, like business in the world what else could they would have wanted like they were already dominated everything but they were like no now we have to kill the entire population and then restart the world but it's like but they weren't doing it to save the world or some kind of like you know goal like that they were just doing it to be a-holes like it's like you're gonna kill all of the people you need people to keep you this rich you need people buying your products and stuff so what's the point of killing everybody so their their plan when they reveal it in the sixth movie you'll see i'll go off on tangents the sixth movie is so awful. Um, and we have Chairman Wesker, played by uh, Sean Roberts, who I think he does a pretty good job. I mean, he's he's a little stiff, and he's even a little um, young, I think, to play Wesker. But uh, but he does an okay job. His delivery, I think some people were saying that he was doing like a bad Agent Smith impression. But I think he was just trying to do a DC Douglas impression, who is one of the voice actors of Wesker in the video games. And he kind of sounds like this sometimes. Um, but I do kind of like this intro because it's like... It, it's like uh, Wesker and Umbrella are are being attacked, you know, and they're like, what's going on? What's going on? And it seems like a monster or some kind of group of monsters is doing this. And, uh, and you're going to, we're going to reveal that it's obviously not any monsters, but I do kind of like that twist of like in every other game and movie, it's always like the, the good guys that are, um, afraid in the opening. Um, but this time it's the bad guys. And I, I kind of like that role reversal there. I think that that's pretty well executed in these scenes. Um, I don't know why these guys aren't dressed like hunk, why they just have these blank socks over their face. Um, but they have, they have pretty much, they look like hunk costumes. They just didn't get gas masks and I don't understand that. Um, but as the last movie promised, um, Alice has an army of clones and now we're going to see a bunch of stupid 3d things <laughs> like her throwing the blades and watch this. Ready? This flip is going to be so stupid. Here we go. Ready? Up. She has momentum going forward. She stops in midair, flips, and then change completely changes her momentum in midair, like impossibly. Like, and again, I know sometimes you're like, oh, we got to do, you got to suspend disbelief and, and things like that. I, I totally get that. But there, you could have shot that way better. She could have still been on wires and kept moving forward while slicing heads off. Like that shot just was really bad. But this is my problem with these movies is they put in all these stupid action scenes like this, which could be like in a Matrix film um, and should be in a Matrix film. But yet um, they're in this Resident Evil movie. That shot's good, though. When the guy lands, that's a good shot. Um, but this is ridiculous, like uh, this this part coming up here. Um, the way... Alice treats her clones as these expendable soldiers is, I, I don't know. It's pretty heartless. Um, I, I guess you can debate all day whether you think clones are real people or not. But to me, the way she cared for the, the safety of that clone at the end of this third movie, uh, you know, I thought she would have a little bit more compassion and feelings towards these women, but I guess for the past year, they've been running from umbrella base to umbrella base, wiping them all out. And now they're at the final one. And that's what sucks about this movie too. This movie should have been about Alice and a bunch of clones throughout the whole movie running around, making their way to this facility. And this could have been the ending of the movie. But, uh, but that's how Paul Anderson writes. He's like, all right, let's wrap up what we started and what we ended the last movie with. Let's wrap it up and get it out of the way and spend our budget here with different Millas. Um, and use these like, you know, cheap camera techniques to like film multiple millas and then use a bunch of body doubles for these wide shots like this. Um, not that obviously, but, but it's funny cause Wesker is like, we need targets. Like show us our targets. It's like, you know, it's Alice. Like if she's been ter running across the world for a year, wiping out all umbrella bases one, how come she didn't get to the base in res evil five? Uh, <laughs> I guess because it's deep, deep underground, uh, in the Arctic or something. Um, 
but then too, like, um, like I just, I wish we would have got that movie on some level where you got to learn some of these clones and maybe that's cause I love star Wars clone Wars so much and stuff, but I'm like, you set up clones, you know, you could have had them working together in this movie and then maybe, uh, their, their goal is, all right, we're going to take down umbrella and then we're going to go find Claire and everybody, you know, from uh, up in, um, Alaska. So she takes a whole year to get to this point, And then we watch her blow through this place in like 10 minutes. And then, she globe hops for the rest of the movie. She takes an airplane and goes back to the U S and goes to Antarctica and goes to Los Angeles and all this stuff. And you're just like, so it took her a year to get here, but it took her like a day to get back to the U S two days, maybe whatever. Again, you're not supposed to really read too much into it, but, um, but here's all the guards are getting shot down. Now the glass broke out behind them. And this is the shot they showed in the trailer is a money shot where they break through the glass terribly by the way that the effects are so bad in that um and then they're just falling straight down into the hub with all this high-tech stuff that's yeah <laughs> um and this soundtrack by the way is by um the score of this movie was done by tom and andy and uh, they did the entire score of this movie. There is one song that appears in this movie by A Perfect Circle. It was a song that was also, it's called The Outsider. It's like a Ren Holder remix or something. It also appeared in the second Resident Evil movie called Apocalypse. And it was officially on that soundtrack. But it, when you buy the soundtrack to this movie, it does not come with that song. Um, but that's probably because it was already in the second movie. So yeah, they, if it costs money to get bands onto your album, they didn't spend that money in this movie. Paul Anderson was all about the 3D and spending all the money on 3D. In fact, before they started filming this movie, and we said uh, Alice just got shot and killed by Wesker, and he's like approaching her now while other Alice's are downstairs killing other guys. And he he looks like he's going to get the jump on another one. But then um, he wants to make sure this one's dead. And oops, grenades. <laughs> Um, but they actually trained the the camera crew had never worked with this James Cameron 3D um, camera before, the Sony whatever. So they they actually paid to train the crew and Paul W. Sanderson on how to use that camera for two weeks before they started filming this movie. And I think this movie was filmed. They had a 55 day shoot period, which is pretty close. the The newest Resident Evil reboot, which is coming out, we've been following that on the channel. Um, I think that was like. It's supposed to be 45 days, but they went 46 days, I think. So pretty similar um, shooting schedules. Although this movie, it makes sense that there was a, a like at least another 10 or 12 days of shooting because of all the um, scenes and action stuff. So I'm hoping that means there's less stupid stuff in this reboot, and that's why they only they needed less, you know, 10 days less to film it. Because this movie has a lot of stupid stuff in it, but a lot of things you have to plan, like with the the multiple millas and everything, you have to like plan things on green screen a very certain way. And, and I think even the final battle, of this movie where Alice is fighting Wesker. I think that even took like six days just to film that fight scene. So again, if there's nothing like that in the new movie, that's fine with me. <laughs> that's fine. Totally fine. So Wesker's flying away in this giant, ridiculous helicopter. That is an airplane too, kind of. And he's setting the self-destruct sequence, but now all these Alice's are just back here. And they're not, they don't make it. And there's not a lot of remorse when each of the clones die. There's not like a minute, like you, they're literally expendable. They're not characters. <clears throat> and that's what upsets me about Paul Anderson is he doesn't know how to write characters. He, he just doesn't. And I, I'll sit here and see him in interviews where he's like, oh, we really want to do this with the character or that with the character. I'm like, stop saying the word character. Like you're an okay director, you know, like you're competent and you, you come in under budget and you do all the things the studios want and you're kind of a yes man sometimes you don't you know you're not about drama and everything and you run a you know a pretty tight schedule so like okay there's a lot of compliments for you but you're not a good storyteller in my opinion and and definitely not a good writer um i like that moment there sean you can kind of see it through the glasses where he kind of realizes someone's behind him um but he and then there where his eyes are wide open but he's not like scared it's he's like, like, cause I said there was a shot earlier where you see his eye twitch and he's like, 
someone's behind me. So he was ready. So he was his hand was probably already reaching down for this serum, uh, this uh, syringe here. But yeah, so she was hiding in his helicopter, I guess. Um, but then he just said right here, he's like, all your powers, speed and strength, accelerated healing, all gone. So he injected her with something that is attacking her T-virus cells. And they're neutralizing them. So now she has no power. So remember this. She has no superhuman powers now. And she's about to survive something that you could only survive with superpowers. <laughs> Even if you are the world's best assassin or whatever, you can't survive a plane crash the way she does. It's ridiculous. Um... When he says, I'm what you used to be, only better, um, that doesn't really make a lot of sense if he knows the truth about her. So again, Paul Anderson had no idea who Alice was as a character when he wrote all these movies. He, uh, he had to figure it out in the sixth movie of who she was. He probably had no idea in the back of his head what he was going to do with that character. Um, here's the big slow-mo crash scene. Again, you're going to see a lot of shots like this just because he wanted to show off that 3D camera. But I will say what I like about this is that the action is slowed down sometimes and you can see what's happening and they're not bad shots. Like this is not a bad shot. It looks okay. Like it doesn't look bad until you add the fire and then it looks bad like the, the CG. But, um, and I love that negative photo like um, image and then it reverts to actual colors. I love that. That was actually a good transition. But look at this, that thing crashed into the side of a mountain. Neither of them could have walked out of there. And she literally walks out like she's freaking Wolverine. Like there's no, and look, she's like, she's got some scrapes and stuff, but she's walking like there's no way that like, and again, I'm suspend disbelief. Sure. But come on, you got to have some level, some level of realism, just some, uh, but Paul Anderson doesn't believe in that. Paul W. Sanderson does not. But instead of that being the movie, like instead of making like all that, the movie. Oh, six months. Yeah. So there's a six months time jump now where she's going back out. So all the interesting stuff, her fighting alongside these clones, getting to know them, attacking different umbrella bases, doesn't matter. That's a real story. So Paul and W. Sanderson's not going to write that story. Um, oh, look at all these greenery and all this ice and water. All three of those things we t were told in the last movie didn't exist anymore. So if you were going to have them in this movie, then why not write a line where Alice goes, holy crap, water's returning, ice is forming again, plants are growing back, what's happening? And why not make that a mystery in this story? So, uh, like if you're going to retcon the previous movie, at least address it and uh, talk about it and add it to the plot of your movie. But they don't do that. Um, and then now Alice is just flying around recording herself making these videos, but for what purpose? There can't be any internet to upload it to. Not really. I mean, I guess you could upload it to YouTube, but who's going to like, who's going to find it to watch it? Um, I don't know. It's like, there's all these things where they're just like, we need exposition. We need talking. We need a scene with Mila here. And that's what this, these movies feel like. They're just, they're just thrown together. It's just like, Hey, how do we get us to make another movie with all of our friends? And that's what they started doing from here on to the next one. And the next one, like four five and six are just family reunions. That's it. Um, which is fine. I mean, these people worked hard on the, on the first, you know, maybe couple movies, maybe they earned it. Maybe on some level there, you're like, Hey, we made a couple ones that were tough. Now we can make some where it's like more of like a family reunion. But like I said, because they, got like that and got lazy and and made it about that and, and making it about bigger action scenes and all this stupid stuff that shouldn't even be in Resident Evil movies. They got a woman's arm uh, cut off in the second movie, a stunt woman. She had a, got injured so bad they had to amputate her arm. And then the sixth movie, they got someone killed. So like, w was it worth it, you know, to just have your, your stupid family reunions when, <laughs> to make these movies? And yeah, you're going to start seeing, hearing me get a little bit meaner and tougher on these because I don't feel like these three movies should exist. 
Like even though I get a little enjoyment out of this one with seeing um, a couple creatures from some of the, well at this time, more recent games, Resident Evil 5, um, and then also seeing Chris and Claire in a movie together, I get a little bit of enjoyment out of that, but that's that's all I get out of this movie. Um, is just the fact that those characters are all on screen and Chris is there and that you get Chris and Claire fighting Wesker. Um, but it sucks that you get them fighting Wesker because they don't have any beef with Wesker. Wesker has like a line he says later where he goes, Chris and Claire, Redfield, you've become quite an inconvenience for me. And you're like, how? Chris was in a jail cell. <laughs> like he wasn't even bothering you. And, uh, and Claire was under your control up until like you know an hour before the ending of the movie. So it's just so, I don't know. But here she finds a helicopter. No one's around. Where's Kmart? Where's Claire? Where's the seven people they were able to bring with them to safety? Like Alice really did, her just showing up in that last movie, she got a lot of people killed. Because there was a caravan of like a bus full of people and then like three SUVs and a truck. And look at that. There was like eight of them fit on that helicopter. That was it. Those were the survivors. <laughs> like... Alice is a dick in these movies. Like she's a, she's like indirectly, um, in some ways, and just the the cause of everyone's pain. But yet the character doesn't have any real flaws. Like okay, you can take her memory. She doesn't know who she is, but that that's not a flaw. She doesn't have a control over that. Like I, I came back after my aneurysm and I had no memories, but that doesn't make me flawed. I'm not flawed because of that. Um, you know, I'm flawed because I have you know, my, my temper acts up, you know, that's like a flaw, like a character trait or, or you're selfish. Like that can be a flaw. Like, but just waking up with no memories doesn't make you flawed. Like, like in, in the sense of like character development in a movie and story. Um, but even in real life, like I'm not flawed because I don't know who, you know, a lot of my memories. Um, and so neither is Alice. Like, and it's all about after you, when you, when you're at that point of where you don't know who you are and you have no memories, it's all about finding yourself, you know, who am I now? Like, who, it doesn't matter who I was then, who am I now? And Alice never goes on that journey. Like, not really. I guess she kind of accepts she's a badass, but that's all she really does. She, um, and look how gorgeous she looks. She looks so gorgeous. It's like a year and six months. No, it's five. Yeah, because the, the third movie was four years or five years after Raccoon City. So this is like five and a half to six and a half years after the end of the world. And she looks like she's gorgeous. <laughs> and I understand it's a movie and, you know, you can't just make her like, I don't know. I, I guess, I don't know. I, I, I guess it's, a, it's a, it, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Because you either don't doll her up and then that's not, you know, most people want to watch gorgeous people in movies, I guess. Um, or you, or you do dollar up and then you have the problem I have with it, which is, you know, I don't know, show a scene where she puts on the makeup then, you know, and she, and then, and she, maybe she's recording herself and she, she's become, fr now that all of her clones are gone, maybe she even says it. She's like, oh, you know, Betty used to do this. And then, and then she's like doing her eyeliner and she goes, who's Betty? Oh, Betty was one of my clones. And, you know, she died, you know, um, you know, when we attacked like a Brazil base of, of umbrella like a year ago and then have her like get quiet because she misses Betty. And then for a moment, and then she goes back, she's like, yeah, so Betty used to, she gave us a bunch of tips on how to do our makeup. And so sometimes when we find makeup kits, we, we put, we, you know, we use it, we put it on. You could, you could do things like that in these movies. And so that way, like you can spend 30 seconds to do that or, you know, or a minute tops, especially when like when you consider how much minutes are wasted in this movie on nothing. And it's funny that Arcadia is, so it, they thought it was going to be a place in Alaska, but Arcadia turned out to be a ship that's going up and down the coast of the U.S. Why would it leave Claire? Like, I don't get it. Like, why, what's what's the plan there? And she's got this bug on her. Um, that Jill had in um, Resident Evil 5. So that was kind of neat when you first see this movie and you're like, oh, wow, um, that's the thing Jill had. So but so that's why she attacked Alice. She doesn't know who she is. She's like acting out of control. But then you have this scene here where Alice goes, what is this? And you literally don't get an answer. Like at all. <laughs> 
You just have to know. You have to play the game to know. And that's how Paul Anderson writes sometimes too. He's like, ah, the fans will know what it is. And and people will get it. Or It's one of those things I, I hear my friend Nathan say that sometimes when you're writing a screenplay, you'll get to a point where it's like, do I explain this or do I just show people what it does and hope they get it? So it's either, so he always says you either get it or you don't, but I don't always like that in situations, um, especially something like this, which you kind of need a little explanation to. But why would they leave someone they had control over here? You know? Kmart. Do you remember Kmart? They have great sales. Oh, I mean, she was a person who does show up at the end of this movie for five seconds. Surprisingly, I was like, oh, wow, I thought they were just going to forget another little girl from the previous movie. They actually bring Kmart back for one scene at the end of this movie. And then we never see her again in the fifth or sixth movie. Presumed dead. Um, so there you go. Satellite watching Alice, just like in the third movie. Um, although this time it's not tracking her directly, I guess. It was maybe tracking that device. So Wesker obviously is still watching her. So we thought Wesker was dead. But he does come back. He's the main villain of this movie. Spoiler alert. <laughs> and you're kind of like, why though? Why, why lead her to Arcadia well, like, I don't know. I don't get it. Like, if he was still alive in that, heli uh, that helicopter slash plane crash, why didn't he just bust his way out of the wreckage like she did and just fight her there and kill her there? Like, why wait six months and and uh, and go to a boat that apparently already existed because Arcadia was set up in the previous movie, which took place a year and a half before this moment right here? So did Wesker leave Tokyo and build a ship i mean i guess he could have had the ship leave the port of tokyo um and head its way to the u.s and that's why it's up and down the west coast of the u.s um but again you're winning no prizes for guessing that if that's the answer you're not actually getting the movie's not answering anything for you uh this is the one freeway i've driven up that it's really beautiful it goes pretty much from la to san francisco um this is my biggest problem with this movie um, is Claire with amnesia. We, we barely got enough out of her in the last movie of what kind of character she was. And now she's a blank slate because God forbid anyone have any character development behind, besides Alice. And since Alice has zero character development, um, you can't, then everyone else can't have it either. So that's what's so frustrating is Claire here, perfect makeup by the way she looks gorgeous Allie Larder I think she she was filming Heroes around the time that this show was or this movie was filming so she um she asked them like I, I already she asked them I think she like worked it out to where there was like seven or eight episodes of Heroes that she wasn't on so that way she could um come and film this movie and it sucks because it's like wow you did all that you 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 rearrange your schedule on a on a show that was a hit that you were on which i'm a huge fan of i actually have a an isaac mendez painting from the first season of the show that was actually used as a prop on the show one of the paintings it's the painting of the um of the eclipse and i have there was like a couple of them made to be used on set and i was gifted one of them because i'm a tim sale fan who was the artist the comic book artist who actually did those paintings um but then also i was a big fan of the show so I have that painting hanging up in my living room. So I love heroes. I love Allie Larder um, on that show. Like she was good. Although I've heard a lot of controversy about her re in recent days about um, what kind of person she was to work with, I guess. So I don't know. I don't know what's true or not. It's hard to, to tell with that stuff. But but there's definitely controversy, I guess, uh, uh, surrounding her. Um, but uh, I think she makes a good Claire. But I just it sucks that she had a hit show and she's like, all right, I'm going to to, to, to film every day on a show and then go and do a movie on the time that you would probably have off or even take time off the show you're working on, tell them to write l your character in less episodes so you can go do a movie. Like you, that's really changing a lot. That's, that's doing a lot as far as career wise. Like that's, that's, that's not an easy thing to do and pull off. And she does it to come to a movie where they literally give her no character development. I mean, that's such an annoying thing. If I would have read this script, I would have been like, nah, sorry, get Jill back. Like if I, if I was Allie and I read this script, I mean, I grant it, people need work and stuff, but 
come on, you have some say in this stuff. You can at least say like, hey, can I can I have something in this movie? Um, because the only thing she does is by the end she gets her memory back, and it's in one quick line where she goes, wait, I remember everything now. This is a trap, and it's like, yeah, we're already we already know it's a trap. <laughs> by that point, you you didn't need to tell us. Um, like it was already clear. So yeah, anyway, so all these zombies have now descended on the jail. And the jail is completely locked down and barricaded. Um, and there's a group of people in there. And they're the last of the people left in L.A. And they might as well be wearing red shirts. And this might as well be a Star Trek episode. Because they'll tell you one thing about themselves. And then they die. There's Kim Coates, who I love. He's awesome. If you've never seen Sons of Anarchy or anything else Kim Coates has been in, then go do yourself a favor. Check out his IMDb and watch everything. Um, these characters are not from the game. There's a lot of made up characters for this movie. Uh, we have Kim Coates plays Bennett. Um, we have, um, Angel played by Sergio, um, uh, Perez Manchetta. Uh, Spencer Locke. She comes back as Kmart later on though, at the end. Boris Kojo uh, as Luther. Um, we have Casey Clark as Crystal Waters. Um, and, uh, Norman Young as Kim Young, I think the assistant to uh, Bennett's character. Um, and then a guy named Fulvio Cesari, who plays Wendell. And Wendell's kind of like the creepy guy who peeks in on the girls when they're taking a shower and stuff. Um, so yeah, kind of a dirt bag. So that's kind of our, our cast of characters. And of course, we'll meet Wentworth Miller in here as Chris Redfield. But that's what frustrated me so much about this movie is I heard Chris was going to be in it and Claire, and I got very excited. But then what happens Claire has amnesia. So when she sees her brother, someone she could actually have conversations with and there could be character development when she talks to him, she doesn't have her memories. And Chris remembers her, but he's also a shady guy locked in a jail cell. So he's kind of like, well, we're like, well, is it, is it really Chris? And and can we trust him? <laughs> and But that doesn't make for an interesting story. You can make that interesting, but this movie doesn't make it interesting. Ooh, it was kind of clever. The guy getting the cable it was kind of clever. That dude's big too. It's like, he's like Chris Redfield, Resi of five big, that guy. Almost. Um, went with Miller. We'll talk about him when he pops up. I don't want to talk too much about him before he gets on screen. This, this money shot here with Luther. Pretty nice. Like I said, some of these shots are cool because they do the slow motion. Because you'll see when we get to Resident Evil 5, um, which is called Retribution, I think, and 6, which is called the final chapter, the editing ruins all the action scenes. Like, it's so sloppy. The action scenes are so sloppy. They probably looked fun filming with wide, you know, like, and wide shots and stuff, and then a couple close ups and handhelds. But then when they edit it together, it's a nightmare. It's such a, it's just a hodgepodge of footage that's on the borderline of giving me a seizure every time. Um, and see like there's no reason Claire should be a dick right now she she literally has no memory and that's it like that's but but that's what I mean like like imagine being Ali Larder you're like hey I got a, a, a script on a show I could be on every episode and make steady money then you have to go to them and say hey sorry they're filming a movie that I want to be a part of I got to go up to Canada to film it um, so like can you like write me out of a few episodes? And then you come to this where on heroes, they actually did stuff with her character and she had like split personality and she was like two her power split her into two people or whatever. And it was like an actual character. And then she comes up here where she just plays a blank slate and she sees people and goes, who are you? And then, or she steps off a plane and says hi to nobody. And that's her shot. It's like, here's your shot. We're going to have Claire Redfield in this scene. What does she do? And then she just steps off a plane and walks away. It's like, that's so what a waste. Paul Anderson is perfect at wasting talent. That's I think that's probably what his best attribute is. Is he's he's really good at wasting everyone's talent. Uh, all these people have potential. Some of these scenes, like this scene's a good scene where the two of them are talking. Um, you know, but uh, 
But I also don't feel like every movie should just be full of sexual tension <laughs> because they just kill the boyfriend or guy character anyway. Um, although I think Luther does show up in the fifth movie, I think. Um, and maybe dies then. I can't remember. Maybe he makes it to, I can't remember if he makes it to the end. Um, but, uh, obviously of course, if I saw Millie Jovich in the apocalypse, you would think you hit the lottery. <laughs> Cause I would imagine, uh, you know, like I would, like if, if I survived the apocalypse, you know, I, I mean, I wouldn't be looking for anyone to settle down with or, or to be intimate with, but, um, I would imagine if I did find someone, uh, they would be as, you know, they would look like me. <laughs> It'd be like me in a wig and people would be like, Oh, you're, you're not Miljovic. I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> um, and they're probably like, okay, well, cool. Nice to meet you. Good luck surviving out here. Like, no way, come back. I'm the I'm the love interest. And they're like, no, you're not. Goodbye. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, dang. So close. But then, yeah, look, Arcadia. And this is great. So, like, Alice Landing, she actually did it, and she needed the help of others. That's pretty great. That doesn't happen a lot in these scripts where she actually needs people help. But then information like this, Arcadia, um... She it gets told to her. She doesn't learn it herself. She doesn't discover it on her own. She doesn't do anything major to like lead to the conclusion of you know and to the answer. It's just like oh Arcadia oh it's a ship it's over there reveal over it's like it's so boring, it's so boring. And like I said, these movies don't need to be Academy Award winning writing uh, scripts like written scripts. They don't need to be that good. But there is a a space between that kind of good writing. And what this is, there is a, a, a area of gray in the middle. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's like she she remembers conveniently. <laughs> she and she has the same kind of memory flashbacks as Alice did, but they ha they they have different. There's no way like her amnesia works that way too. Um. Like, I would have done something visually different with her memories. I would have made them red because, you know, the, the liquid inside the spider was red. So that would have been cool if there was like a red haze over her memories. Because um, showing it in black and white, I'm like, yeah, that's kind of what they did. In, well, not exactly black and white, but they did like a, they shot through filters in the first movie when Mila was remembering who she was. And it's kind of, I don't know. It's like Mila's, we find out in the sixth movie, she was like created like a year before she lived in the mansion or something like she, she's like a, a clone. Um, and again, so you would think you would want to write, write some scenes where her other clones died and she has compassion for them. But no, but again, Paul Anderson didn't know where, um, her journey was going to end because he originally was just going to have the third movie end with Alice and a bunch of clones going, all right, umbrella, we're coming after you. And then that was going to be it. And that was, that was his big finale. <laughs> um, and on some levels, I kind of wish it did just end that way because then we wouldn't have these movies. Um, but this one at least looks okay. But after you get past this one, five and six are awful. Like they, there's a couple things that look nice, like sets and things like set designs and stuff that look good. But um, for the most part now. And now we are, we yeah, we cut to an underground where... There's like a, a zombie digging through the ground because it's, I guess, they've been up on the surface trying to get through the gates of the prison for so long that some of them actually got smart and started digging. Um, and you're going to start seeing things in this movie that um, make no sense as far as like the, the, the type of virus that's going around because it's the T-virus that broke out everywhere. At least that's what they keep saying in all the movies. But yet, you're going to see Las Plagas monsters in this. And it just makes no sense to have them here without at least some explanation. And you could have set that up in the beginning when Alice is crashing through the Tokyo lab. Like I said, if you set it up throughout the whole movie where this whole movie was Alice and clones going from lab to lab, and then maybe you, like, at each lab, you maybe you could start off in the beginning, they tack, like, a lab in Brazil. And it's she's like, it's not Wesker's, dang it. But it's down to her and, like, two other clones and then the three of them meet up with these people um 
and then proceed on to Tokyo or something. And that's like their big thing is they're building up to Tokyo. And, but Alice keeps saying, Oh, Arcadia, we got to go back to Arcadia. Um, and then maybe there's a point in the movie where her and a couple the clones and a couple of these people go to Tokyo at the end. And then you have a couple of these people go off to Arcadia and you could have used them in the next movie or something. Um, you could have done something like that maybe, but I don't know. I just, I'm trying, I'm just like spitballing a bunch of ideas. Cause now I've seen this movie like uh, over a dozen times. And like I said, I watch it sometimes as a guilty pleasure, but I watch it cause some of these shots are good shots. They look good. Um, but like, like, cause they're actually taking their time. They're having a scene here. People are talking and people are learning information. And then now she realizes, Hey, there's a guy locked in the cellar. It's like, Oh, that's cool. Let's go find out who it is. And, and then we get introduced to Chris Redfield. So it's there's some scenes in here are pretty good, but but overall, like there's a that's why I have a guilty pleasure for this one and, and not the other ones. Like uh, five and six are, are just garbage. They don't even try. Like in my opinion, they're just just a bunch of friends getting together, spending other people's money to make a movie, and they don't. There's no effort. I feel. Um, and they're they're sloppy, sloppy filmmaking. The fifth and sixth movie. Um, and they've got the red barrels there. <laughs> I don't know if those are nods to the game specifically or not, but here's the peeping Tom. Yeah. But I do like that setup. There's a, I hear, you saw the guy digging, the zombie digging, and then he says, I hear movement in the walls. So again, set up, set up, and we'll see a payoff later when uh, one of those things in the walls uh, eats somebody. I think Mila just had a kid right before she started filming this. So that's uh, pretty awesome. She, she worked really hard to get back into shape to play this character. And then also Wentworth Miller here, who plays Chris Redfield. He's wearing the gloves that Chris had in one of the games where some of the fingers are cut off. Yeah, his hands are wet. <laughs> yeah, so he looks like Chris. I like him as Chris. Um, he's, he's sounding a little gruff here. I think he said in an interview, he was like, so he got cast for this movie like three weeks before it came out. There was Jensen Echols was rumored to play Chris. Uh, from Supernatural, and then I guess he couldn't because of his scheduling with Supernatural. And there was another actor that was going to play Chris and e ended up going to Chris, uh, Wentworth Miller. Uh, Sean Roberts, who plays Wesker, he also was going to audition for Chris if Wentworth passed on it. But Wentworth took the role, never played the game, started to look up images online of Chris and saw a bunch of images from Resident Evil 5 where Chris is very big and bulky. And Wentworth was like, look, man, I start filming in like three weeks. There's no way I'm going to get in shape enough to be Chris. <laughs> Not that kind of Chris. He goes, but luckily he saw pictures of Chris from Resident Evil 1 and Code Veronica. And he said, okay, that Chris is more uh, obtainable in three weeks. So he started working out, doing a bunch of cardio and all that stuff. Um, Wentworth Miller, I'm in love with that guy. I have a total man crush on him. Um, I believe he's gay in real life. And he also, like me, has uh, gone through, um, I think, uh, an attempt on attempt of suicide um and he is the reason that in all my videos on youtube that uh, on my main channel um i should add him over here too actually um on my main channel i have in the, the description box a bunch of uh contacts for um you know suicide prevention and, and help clinics and stuff and it's because of wentworth it's because i watched a video where he uh talked about his his um, bouts with suicide and, and uh, depression. And he, uh, he, it inspired me to, you know, cause I had just gone through something like that around that time. And it inspired me to start putting those links in all my videos. Um, but Wentworth Miller is, uh, like I said, he, I think he is a good, he's a good choice for Chris. I just think it sucks that they put him in a movie where the one person he could interact with to get character development is, besides Alice and no one's going to get character development with Alice because these movies are all about her. It's like, a, it's almost like a vanity project in some way. And, and that's not to slam Mila. She's their cash cow. And in some ways like they, she's, 
you know, Paul is her husband. He writes and directs these movies, uh, most of them. And uh, this is kind of her, she's the face of this franchise. But it just sucks that they won't allow other characters to even be slightly cooler than they are. Like some of them you could be like, oh, I like that actor, like the guy who plays Luther. And I like Ali Larder. And I like, you know, even this guy is cool. Um, but they don't really like uh, give them big moments to shine in these movies. And I wish they would so that they had a purpose for being there <laughs> other than just a quick scene like this. Because it's like, oh, these two are connecting maybe. Maybe we can learn more about their characters and maybe they can buddy up in the movie. But no, this is the only scene they get together and they don't really interact anymore after this. It's r ridiculous. Let me cut back to this guy holding a nudie magazine. <laughs> Which has got to be so gross for Chris. Chris is just... In his cell, and there's a guy reading a nudie magazine right next to him. <laughs> it's like, that's got to be a little uncomfortable. But yeah, he hears more digging, as he says. And movement, or that's what he called it, movement. Um, but here's where that, that setup gets paid off. Um, the tile in the bathroom starts to get plucked up, which is funny because... You can see the shower heads right there and you can see right here where the tile is going to pop up and it's not exactly hidden, you know, like it's, it's pretty obvious like that there's going to be a hole in the floor there, but yet in a minute when Alice goes in there to shower, they don't even notice a hole on the floor. Now this is neat. So this is the executioner, um, in the video games in Resident Evil five, he's called the executioner in, uh, this movie, he's called the Axe Man. I think they renamed him the Axe Man, but he's but in the games he's called um, the Executioner. Now, there's not a novelization of this movie, so there's no explanation of how the hell that monster ends up just walking down the streets of L.A. and where it came from. There's, a, um, I guess, a theory. I think I saw online. Fans said that it probably came from Arcadia that Wesker dropped it off, but you know. Um, we don't see that in the movie, so you, you don't really know. And no one in the movie even says, oh yeah, we sent the executioner to, to wrangle you guys. Cause I guess Wesker wants them to come to Arcadia. That's his whole, his, that's his plan is, oh, Alice is on a trajectory to head back here to Arcadia. So I'll just wait here for her. And that's his big plan, which seems dumb, but then he's going to send in this monster that could actually kill her. <laughs> so I guess maybe that's a bonus. Maybe he doesn't want her to arrive alive at his place. But again, here to the left, she should be able to see the the hole in the floor. Unless it was a different floor. Maybe it's the floor beneath them and there's a shower down there and that's where, but I don't know. Like, so maybe it's a different shower room that the tile came up. But she's conveniently not going to the left. She does look over there right now, but she doesn't see the hole. But yeah, but this is just a reveal, like, to reveal that they have a creep in the group, which we already knew because we just saw him reading a nudie magazine. But yeah, like I said, it's it's just a shame that some of these other characters can't get any kind of forward momentum. And and you'll see actually coming up here that like even Mila's character Alice like. She has to be the one to like get the the death kill on all the major monsters. Like she's got to be the one to get all the big moments. They don't really sh she doesn't share moments with other characters. Oh. So yeah, boom. We got the Las Plagas monsters. Actually, these are those are more from Resident Evil 5. Um so it's like the the Kajuju, like a uh, the um, the group of people that were in Africa that have like, um, oh, what's the, the Ganados, is it? I think it's Ganados, but it's like, uh, it's like a mixture between the, that parasite from four and, and like the evolution of it in five after Wesker it, it advances them a little, I guess. Cause obviously at Wesker gets a sample in the Resident Evil four video game. Ada is working for Wesker. Like she was in Resident Evil two, as we learned from the Wesker report. And she brings him a sample of Las Plagas. And then he uses that, the G-virus and the T-virus, 
um, and kind of makes Ouroboros. But um, also under Ouroboros, he has like these parasites that are kind of like Las Plagas that he has spread around this village in Africa, um, which sucks because then it makes everyone there a victim. Like everyone, you're shooting all these people, but they're actually innocent. They're just infected by this parasite, much like the bakers. Um, so it actually added a little bit of tragedy to the events of, of Resident Evil 5, actually. But in this movie, you have no idea, like, why is the Axeman? Because the Axeman is like a very specific creature made a very specific way in the fifth video game. Um, it's not like a T-virus infected person who just mutates. Like, there's more to him. And much like a, a nemesis or something, there's an a Mr. X. Like, there's actual work put into him. But in this movie, it's just like, eh, whatever. He's just a character from the game. It doesn't matter, like, how he got here. So they throw him in here. Um, and then the the zombies having the the tentacles coming out of their mouths and later on the dogs splitting in half like they do in Resident Evil 5. Um, it's just like, I don't know why it's in here. <laughs> like It's cool to see it because I'm a fan of, of the games and stuff, but I like this. Just staring at him. <laughs> but I think Wentworth Miller, I, was, I, was, I, got, I cut myself off earlier. He said... um. He said, the way I'm playing this Chris is that um, he's rough around the edges, but the edges are so rough that they're jagged. Um, he was like, the, the version of Chris in this movie is a guy who was trying to do the right thing. He came to this jail cell to, you know, to do the right thing and protect the, the prisoners as the virus got worse and worse. And then once the prisoners got out, I guess they kind of took a little bit of pity on him and then threw him in this cell as like a way, as like a, to leave him here to die. Um, as like a ironic punishment for him, I guess. Um, but I don't know. I, I, I don't know, but we don't really get the full backstory on Chris, but I guess whatever happened to him, it, it really changed him. Um, so he is, is not like a nice person and that's why he talks way he does. And he's a little bit more mysterious and he's not like the boy scout that we see in the games. Um, but I don't mind that too much. I mean, we're going to get a version of Chris like that coming up in Resident Evil Village uh, where he seems to be definitely like a darker Chris <laughs> for sure. I love that. Sh sit down when shots are fired. I like that sign back there. Um, but yeah, so, but I like this. I like when they come up with plans for things. It's like, hey, here's a plan. I know of a vehicle upstairs. It's our way out. But he wouldn't tell them what it is because he knew once he told them, they would probably just leave him in the cage like the prisoners did. Um, so he has trust issues. <laughs> but then he sees Claire and he has a moment of like, you know, where he's like, oh my God, Claire. Like he, you know, he, he feels something. He's the, the edges, the rough edges have smoothed out a little bit. And I, I kind of like that. Um, but yeah, check this dude out. Like pins through his head and everything. It's really cool. And I like that there's a reaction where she goes up and she's like, oh my God, what the hell is that thing? Like, I, I like that that's her reaction. It's neat. So this part is another one of those scenes where it's just like they they couldn't come up with anything else. Like she has to swim and, and they have to do like... I understand they want to add tension here, but it, it's so goofy, the type of tension. It, they already have to... They already have to put an engine into a truck... Or, or I guess they, they, they don't know that yet. <laughs> I guess maybe that's a good point. Um, but it's still just like there is there is sometimes just unnecessary things here. I guess they wanted, hey, we got to get some weapons. Um, and I don't know how guns work. I think if they get wet, they're okay for the most part. But I guess it depends on how long they're wet. I like this. He actually does the smart thing. Like, let's just shoot him. They shot him, he shot him like three times in the face and it didn't do anything. I'm like, okay, at least they're trying to solve the problem. But again, if Alice took one shot into that thing's head, it would die. <laughs> As we see later. I mean, she granted, she shoots like a, a roll of quarters into his head. But still, like that's that's what I mean by Alice. She's always the one to, to solve things. Um, and everyone else, they're just like the primer. They get killed by the monster and Alice finishes the monster off. Or, or they go like, hey, Alice, here, here's a gun. And they pass her the gun and she gets the kill. I'm like, why don't you use the gun? Like, 
aren't you a character too? <laughs> but it's like, no, Alice is our best shot at everything, at surviving, at, at, at everything. So that's what they do. They just have her be the problem solver every single time. So yeah, so now we got swimming zombies coming through. Oh, no. Who broke through the wall then? I think I think it's a, supposed to be a zombie that broke through that. But um, yeah, like this scene again, just all long and unnecessary. And it's just like it's just because Paul Anderson wanted some shots underwater that he could use with the 3D camera. Um, like I said, I I think he saw Avatar and just got like a total hard on for that camera because when this movie was coming out, they promoted it. They said this was filmed with the the same cameras that James Cameron used for Avatar. And it's like, who gives a shit? <laughs> like, really, that's your selling point? Is it's the same cameras. Well, it doesn't have, is James Cameron operating it? Then who cares? <laughs> Get James Cameron to direct Resident Evil? Um, but yeah, pa but Paul Anderson, he's such a fanboy. He loves aliens, obviously, and he's a big James Cameron fan. So, so when he saw James Cameron had a new piece of technology and Sony was willing to, you know, because Sony distributes this movie, they were willing to like, uh, or, or, they're a part of it. Sony's part of the distribution, I think. I think Screen Gems is mainly, but Screen Gems, I think, is owned by Sony. But I think it, it's just one of those moments where it's like, uh, hey, if you use our camera, we'll give it to you at a, a, a great discount um, or whatever, and, and we'll give you, we'll pay for your training on it and stuff. And I think that's really all Anderson cared about. These are three very gorgeous people. Like, all three of them are gorgeous. <laughs> like, no kidding. Oh, but she's dead. And that's how she dies. She doesn't die doing anything heroic. She dies just standing there. Why would he jump back? I don't know. Whatever. You're lucky those guns are firing, brubs. I love the shot where where she, um, where the girl in the middle, she like, uh, pulls out her gun and like water just sprays every like she lifts it up and just water flies off her arm and stuff. It's pretty funny. It's a good shot. I don't think it was meant to do that, but they just kept it in. I do like the red light, like the way she's lit like that. I actually, it's a cool shot. Um, but now they're in a pitch back room, black room full of, uh, you know, weapons. So I hope she has more of those flares, but yeah, they basically just gather a bunch of weapons to bring them. And, and that ends up being worthless too. Like, so they're, everything they're doing is just, it doesn't matter. And that's the downside about this as a movie is like, you want efforts that they make to mean something. So when they come up with this plan to like go in and, and get this truck and it's like, okay. And I, and I understand sometimes you want those plans to go wrong, like oceans 11 style. It's like, here's our plan, here's our plan, and then the plan kind of goes sideways, but they still pull something off. This movie's not like that. It's like they still pull something off, but it's something so ridiculous. Like, you're just, you're like, why don't just, why didn't the truck thing just work? Because he's like, look, here's the engine. Like, why would anyone take the engine out of it? Like, like, why would they just have one of those vehicles here and the engine not in it? But again, boom, another character dies for no reason, doesn't do anything heroic. I mean, I'm not saying no reason. He's like, hey, um, assistant guy, we're going to go up and get on that plane on the roof. It fits two people, and the two of us are going to go to Arcadia. So it makes sense that he would, um, you know, want just the two of them to sneak away. But to shoot the guy just seems like, <laughs> it seems, I understand he's desperate, but I don't know. Whatever. It makes him a villain, I guess. Sure. It it, it, it uh, succeeds in that. So I guess they swam down two floors and then went over and then swam back up two floors because when they were in the other area, the water stopped at the top of the stairs and then now they climbed another level up to get back to where they were. I don't know. I think Resident Evil does a really good job in the games of the geography of things, of like where things are for the most part, um, except in 4 a little bit. Uh, Resident Evil 4 kind of gets a little sloppy with the the maps, but then they add these like little carts that bring you from one side of the castle to another to help fix that a little bit, which is kind of lazy. 
But um, but in Resident Evil One, even the movie, uh, there's all those like holographic or digital maps that they use, so you kind of know where they are in the the hive at all times. That's a cool shot, actually, where the the the, hel- the helicopter blade just like cut through all these zombies. Um. Yeah. Does he know how to? F- I mean, I guess he knows how to fly it. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. I'm just, uh, I'm just rambling and I'll probably for- forget to finish thoughts. So if there's something I trail off on or forget or, de- or don't circle back to if I forget or whatever, um, there you go. Hand her the gun. She'll do it. Um, it, it, you know, just ask me in the comments if you, if you want to, and I'll, I'll answer down there. Cause yeah, I f- I'll forget. I forget where I was. Shoot the red barrels, bruh. So this is not a bad idea that she comes up with. Um, it's dangerous as shit, but I mean, when you're desperate, I, I don't mind this. It's, it feels very like almost Indiana Jones-ish in a little way, like where she's just like, well, this is gonna, or Die Hard-ish maybe. Like, we got to do it. It's going to suck. Um, yep. Boom. But she knew, I think, from earlier because of the elevator shaft that they were in. So it's another setup and payoff that there's going to be water at the bottom. Um, the only downside she doesn't know is, are they going to be able to um, open the gate and get out? <laughs> like when they hit, like right here. Oh, yeah, the gate. Oh, yeah, the gate's not on it. Um, she shut the outside gate. But, yeah, the, the gate to the, the actual uh, elevator is not there because it's like a freight elevator. Although normally those have an extra layer of extra door or whatever. Um, that was a good shot. It's too well choreographed and timed to look organic when, when the camera turns and reveals all the zombies running at her. It's almost like they start right when the camera hits the first zombie as opposed to them already in mid-stride. But remember, Alice has no superpowers here. So she's just bungeeing off this building on a cable that's definitely not 20 feet you know, or 20 stories. So now she, yeah, it didn't, it didn't blow that cable up that didn't get damaged. And then now she's going to drop like, well, that, that rope went down a lot farther than it should have. <laughs> but yeah, she drops like two stories down to the, the entrance way. Um, and does like a tuck and roll with no scars or nothing. But here we go, ready? 3D. 3D. Another zombie's head explodes. Forget these guns, I don't need them anymore. And quarters. I do like her arms go back there. That would really screw up your um, momentum. Yeah, she almost hits him, which is not good. But uh, yeah, I love that reveal where he looks back and sees the quarter. And this is, it's all well done. That That's actually, I mean, it's a stupid action scene, but it's its pretty well done and you can see what's going on and, and it's very clear what's going on. And that's more than I can say for the fifth and sixth movie. But now here they are looking at the hole. <laughs> I'm like, like, oh, look at that. So again, maybe it's just a different shower room. I don't know. Could be. All right. That's a nicely shaped, like one zombie dug that. Very nice of that zombie to make a a circle big enough for guys like Luther <laughs> and Chris Redfield. Oh. Again, dying just standing there. I mean, that's the thing about this movie is people die just standing there. They don't die for anything. Like in Resident Evil, you know, Richard Aiken will die because he pushes Jill out of the way and gets bit by the snake or he pushes Chris out of the way and gets bit by the shark. Um, 
You have uh, Enrico who dies. Uh, he, he is just sitting there and he's bleeding out, but he dies because he's about to reveal who the traitor is. So there's like a reason for it. Um, this it's just like, hey, can we get a couple shock value things in? Now this scene I was really excited for when I saw it in the trailer because I thought this meant Claire was going to get a moment to shine. Like I'm like, oh, Claire versus a monster from the fifth game. A, a mo she never Claire never met this creature in any of the games. The, uh, the Executioner or the Axeman. They never met in any of the games. So I was really excited to see this like as just a fan of the games and the characters and monsters. So I was really hoping like we would get Claire be the one to kill it and take it down. And these shots are nice. Like they're a little stupid and matrixy, but they're nice. Um, you know, and she's, it's a little slow-mo, which I'm not, I'm not a big fan of, but I'd rather the slow-mo than the way the th fifth and sixth movies are edited. They're so bad. They're like those uh, Liam Neeson movies, the Taken movies. They're so bad. Well, the first Taken movie wasn't that bad, but the second and third were. So yeah, so we, again, these scenes run a little too long. I'd rather them get to the, all right, we did the slow-mo. Let's get to the point now. But this, this is neat stuff. Like uh, Claire versus the Axeman. I'm, I'm really geeking out right now, actually, just smiling, watching this. Look how big he is. Like, it, this is, it's well done. I like how she slides on the boot, and then, boom. She uses, um, she uses Alice's gun and shoots the quarters up into the creature that go through his head and chest. And that's awesome. Like, she, she basically kills him. And I honestly was like, wow, they actually let a character other than Alice get the kill. Um, but of course, that's not the case. She looks so great here too. Wow. <laughs> Claire, you're so fine. But yeah, nope, he's getting back up now. I love that. It looks like he has a beard too. He's got like this, or no, it's just a part of the, the bag on his head. Yep, 3D, 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 3D. Boom. And then now, through the raindrops, doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I mean, the the coins would have flown everywhere. And here's the thing: is I know people are going to go, "Well, it's fine. It's just suspension of disbelief." No, no, no. Just a minute ago, outside, she fired the coins, and they went in a bunch of different directions. Just a second ago, Claire shot the uh, coins at close range, and they went in different directions and caused a lot of damage because it was close range. But here she's like 20 feet away, 15 feet away. And it went through the thing like a single bullet and exploded in its head, which that doesn't make any sense. Even if she bundled up the quarters like that, because they already established the quarters spread like shotgun shells do. So, but I do like that concept. Uh, the concept of putting the quarters in is neat when it's like, Oh, I'm running low on ammo, but I, I found a way to just add quarters to the shells. Like, yeah, it's it's a it's a dumb movie thing, but I, I don't mind that part. I just don't like how inconsistently they work. <laughs> That's the bad part. Um, but now we get this scene where they're crawling through a hole in the ground. We got Alice and Claire, Claire Bear, which I think is a reference to uh, Heroes. I work with a girl named Sarah. Sometimes I call her Sarah Bear. Um, I think I just get that from Heroes. All right, Luther. I was wondering what was going on with him because he's kind of like, he's in a separate hole waiting for them, I guess. Um, yeah, whatever. It doesn't matter. Huh, Echo. Hi, Bubba. My dog just came in. Hi, buddy. I have to let him know where I am because he's he's been losing his sight slowly because he's getting older. So when he... He, he usually stands in a doorway, um, whether it's in the living room or like in this bedroom where we're at now, he'll stand in the doorway and wait for me to say his name to see if I'm in there. But he heard my voice recording this podcast, so he's good. You good, buddy? All right. A little cameo. I know you don't, not a picture of him on screen, but I know, uh, just want you to know he's here. So yeah, oh, Luther stuck behind.
but it's like it's weird the way the characters and roles reverse because Alice this whole movie seems to be like someone who when people die around her she's not really having that big of an an effect like it's not mattering to her to that much, but I guess since she kind of liked Luther, that's why she had a moment there where she's like, "No," and Claire's like, "We got, we can't, we, you know, he's, he, he, we can't go back for him." And it's like, uh, yeah, but usually Alice is the one saying that, so you would some people would argue, "Oh, that's a character moment where she's growing and learning to care again." But it's like, no, she, she cared a little bit in the beginning. She came to look for her friends in Arcadia and found Claire. So she's always kind of cared, but she just forgets to care sometimes when it's when they just want to move along the story. Hi, Echo. Hi, handsome. Handsome boy. Oh, you're a good boy. All right, here we are, Arcadia, the ship. There's been a couple Resident Evil games that end on ships. Um, Resident Evil Survivor, I think there's a scene where you take a ship to another island on Sheena Island, I think. Or no, maybe that was um, Survivor... Gun Survivor 2? What was that one called? Dead Aim. Um, maybe that was Dead Aim. There was Gun Survivor 2 Code Veronica, and there's Gun Survivor 3 Dino Crisis. But the technically the second one that came out here in the U.S. was called Dead Aim. And Dead Aim, you played as a guy named Bruce McGivern and uh, and a woman named Fawn Lynn. And you were on a ship, and then it ended by crashing on an island that you had to go and fight this guy named Morpheus. <laughs> uh, probably taken from matrix so here we have the cla uh, crashed plane ship uh, cl crashed plane no ship part um and it had like some cgi smoke coming off of it which looked pretty bad but this shot looks good with the three of them looking at the wreckage that's a good shot with the water behind them it does look good um but so yeah you had a dead aim took place on a boat res evil 7 recently that uh kind of the third act uh, right before the ending of the game is on a on a boat um, this is a set I'm pretty sure this is not an actual um, quarter uh, head you know main um, main room from a, a, a ship a boat um, like this is a I have to believe this is actually a set with all fake yeah because that's why the blinds are pinned like that on the in front of them but this is a, yeah on a set with ar artificial light actually i think you can see a a butterfly out there or, or some kind of giant uh lighting rig out there shining the lights inside but yeah life uh life boat uh, deployment um so this is when claire's memories conveniently come back to her um where she's just like Oh, I, I know what's going on. It's a trap. But it's like, by this point, you know it's a trap. Because it says there's 2,000 people on board. And then you're going to see this logo. And it's like, okay. Like, of course it's a trap. It's just weird. It's like they run up and put these things on their chest. Okay, so this shows how Claire got away, but the bug allows you to control the person who has it on. So why why didn't they just tell her to come back? It's like, all right, the bug's on her. Just tell her to come back. And uh, someone's going to go, yeah, but Wesker wanted her to go get away so that you know she, Claire could lead um, Alice to the boat. It's like, yeah, but Wesker wasn't a part of that raid. He was in Japan at this time. <laughs> like, I guess maybe he could have been like conferencing with them or giving them their orders, but it's a, it's it's like he didn't know he his, he was gonna kill Alice back in Japan. Like he he blew the place up. So <laughs> whatever, whatever. But yeah, this this movie it does pull a lot from Resident Evil Five, um, but it doesn't know why it's pulling from Five. It just does it because Paul Anderson's like, yeah, it looks cool. And that's it. That's his reason. He doesn't really come up with a organic story reason for anything that he pulls. Uh, case in point, the final battle coming up. If you ever get a chance to watch Red Letter Media, um, check out their channel. I love their channel. They're so awesome. Uh, Mike and Jay and Rich and everyone over there, Jack, um, Colin and all them. Like they're, and McCullough Culkin has been on the show a couple times. Um, I love those guys. And their videos, by the way, that's not, Allie Larder's hand, that's Mila's hand. 
I think I found that out on the commentary track. So if I'm wrong, the commentary track will tell you whose hand that actually is. But it's not Ali Larder's hand. It's an insert shot they added later, they said. Um, like a second unit add-on shot where they just needed someone's hands. Oh, no, they didn't add it. They, they had Mila's hands from later in the movie. When she uses it, uh, there's a close-up of her hand, and she uses it. But um, but so they just reused that shot and just made it seem like it was Claire's hand. So it's Kmart. Okay, and then what? But like, as we're gonna find out that thing on their chest, it helps control them, right? Because in Resident Evil 5, the game, when Jill wears it, that's the thing you have to remove so that way she stops fighting you, which means she's under control through that. Um, Jill's also in the fifth game is um, infected because of her events of Resident Evil 3. She has T-virus strands in her. So when Wesker puts this device on her and starts to control her and feeds this chemical into her, it alters her skin pigmentation to be lighter and it, it it also kills her hair a little bit to where it turns like silvery blonde um and that's all effects of the the thing on her chest um but it makes her in like it makes her being able she's able to be controlled by wesker um with that thing on her chest so these people having it it's like why didn't kmart just come out kung fu fighting everybody and being controlled by wesker instead she freaked out like oh my god what's happening what's happening but yet Claire fought Alice like immediately. So, so it's like the rules, like there's just no consistent rules with any of the shit in this movie. Um, like I said, Paul Anderson just throws things in there. He's like, oh, the thing on her chest. Yeah, people in the game from the game will remember that from Resident Evil 5. Oh, the dogs, they split in half now. People will know that from 5. And the zombies have tentacles come out of their mouths. They'll know that from 5. <laughs> it's like, okay, but so what <laughs> like what reason do they have to be in this movie and so this is the point where you're i guess you're meant to think maybe chris isn't chris like maybe but i don't know but he is so it doesn't matter and then you have whatever the hell these things are i think they're just people that were pulled out of their cages and fed on by Wesker he needs it like I think he says he needs to ingest living DNA now so I guess they were killed that's why there's blood all over those chambers back there and then he just brought them in here and sucked them dry like a vampire but again you're you get a little information to draw that conclusion but it's not really spelled out for you so so it because it's ambiguous it makes it it just makes this movie even worse. But now you have Wesker in his Resident Evil 5 clothes. That's not even a good reveal. Like, I like the guy. He looks great. He's actually in the straight-up costume from Resident Evil 5 that Wesker wears. Um, yeah. He's like, I knew you'd be drawn to your friends. That's how he put together this master plan he just a hunch this is where you see yeah he's in full control of them so it's like okay if he's in control of them then why does he need the 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 spiders on everyone else but then i again i'm going to win a no prize here i'm going to guess he has a spider on everyone else's chests so that way that he can just tell them hey all right step out of your pod walk in here lay down on the table and let me drink you blood you know drink your blood and drink you dry so they don't put up a fight but yet he killed a couple of these people in their chambers where he splattered blood everywhere so <laughs> oh, i don't know what whatever, whatever. There's, there's no logic and then why is wesker like why is he special because he's like, yeah, I have the T-virus, but I'm fighting for control, and it's fighting me for control. So what is different about him? Because he says earlier, I'm like Alice, but I'm like, he says to her, I'm like you, but but better. But then, okay, if he's 
if he's like her but better, how come he needs her to ingest? He needs to ingest her so he can be in control again. But it's like, but why? Um, and if he needed her, why send a bunch of monsters that probably could have cut her head off? Why not just go grab her <laughs> and drain her? Here we go, we get some 3D. So here's the Outsider song by A Perfect Circle, the remix. So this is the one time they play it in the middle of this movie, or this part of the movie, and then they play it again at the end. Um, but it's a song that was already on one of the Resident Evil soundtracks, uh, Resident Evil Apocalypse. So I don't think they had to spend any... Oh, well, I'm sure they still had to spend something to get the song again, maybe. But yeah, so these are the dogs from Resident Evil four and five kind of so this shot here coming up if you watch the red letter media video on this where they react to they watch res evils one through four the movies so from the first movie up into this one and they laugh so hard during this scene <laughs> yeah his eyes do look cool So this shot here, all of this right now, is a complete recreation from a fight scene in Resident Evil 5 where Chris and Sheva fight Wesker. And it's almost shot for shot exact. Um, boom. Chris hitting him. I mean, this is all him stopping like that. All of these are shots from the game. So I saw Red Letter Media just having a field day laughing at the scene. You hear Rich with his very loud laughter. It's so funny. I love watching it. Because they they have no idea they don't they're not fans of the game or anything so they're just watching the scene and just thinking how stupid it is, and yes it is a stupid scene, but it is a scene that is a hundred percent ripped from the games. In the game, Sheva is the one who stabs Wesker there, and then this, <laughs> and then now this gets to a point where this is different because in the game, Chris and Shev aren't like right next to each other shooting Wesker like that. I don't think anyway, I don't remember it being like that because right there, those bullets, they would have probably hit Chris. So I think Sheva and Chris had a little bit more sense than to sh cross shoot like that. Um, but Paul Anderson doesn't have that sense, a common sense. So he just staged the fight like that. And it's like, Oh, that's not good. And again, I like this shot coming up here uh, where Chris needs to get out of the, the cell and he tries to shoot it. Yeah, and he breaks, it, it cracks the glass, but it doesn't break it. But I do like that he tried. Like, again, it's just one of those things where you're like, ah, try something, do something. And I think Wentworth Miller probably came up with those things on the spot. I don't know if those were written or meant to do that. Um, but I think in a lot of these movies, when they, <laughs> when they film these, they, there's a lot of talk with the actors, um, and they ask the actors like things they would like to do or, or you know, they, they listen to suggestions. Um, but um, I don't know. A lot of times it doesn't seem like it, it's they're not always the best suggestions. But I think that one with Chris, if that was a ad lib thing that he came up with on the day even before they shot it, if he was just like, hey. What if we did this? Like I th I, that was a good idea because I like seeing characters try to get out of traps and not just give up. But oh, it's Kmart. <laughs> yeah, you should watch the scene with Red Letter Media. They're laughing so hard at the, all this. It's so funny. Oh look, she has no speaking line and she just tosses the gun to Alice. She doesn't shoot. She doesn't use the gun herself and try to get revenge on the guy who locked her up. She just hands the gun to Alice. <laughs> God forbid Kmart have an actual moment. So here, there you go. There's her hands again. Again, I don't think, I can't remember. Either they are Allie's hands and they use them for both shots or they're Mila's hands and they use them for both shots. Or they're someone else's hands and they use them for both shots. But either way, it's it's not two different women's hands. It's just the, the footage from the same scene they did earlier and they just replicated it. So look at that. He has no brain in his head. And then, boom, boom. So I do like this as a conclusion um, because it actually gives other characters something to do, but they don't kill Wesker either, so it doesn't matter. Um, but that, but them standing over and, and they're like, 
it's almost like, all right, stands like, I don't think so. You're not getting back up because now we have you at point blank range. <laughs> I'm a producer. I actually like that line. Yeah. I'm a producer. So this is one of those things. So I don't know what's wrong with him. He seems like he might be infected. I know he crashed a, a plane, but... So that scene there, I like that line. I just want to go home. Um, try and add a little sympathy to the guy before he gets eaten. Um, but uh, he turns and he you know, sees something. We don't know what it is. But of course, here we go. Like, it's, it, it's just Wesker rebuilding his body and then feeding off him I think um yeah so I don't know yeah so he rebuilds his body and he's like I like the little twitches he does it's it's a good character thing I like it um but yeah because she remembered earlier that he blew up the ship that was the scene at the beginning before she walks in uh, into his final lab room where she sees him, she turns and looks at one of the ships. And how she knew he was going to take this one when there was like three ships in the hangar bay, I don't know. But she hit all the bombs on this ship. But I thought he was going to like turn into a... Um, I like his eyes light up there. That's very Resident Evil 2 where it like closes up on the eyes and stuff. Um, you actually see if you look real closely here, Yeah, I love it. she's like, come on, let's go, let's go. And it was just to show them. But see that, it looks like a parachute off to the side. Yep. Um, and parts of the ship. I mean, it could just be parts of the ship. But it looks like a parachute. And then you have Luther come out and you find out he's still alive. So this could explain how Wesker finds him in the next movie, because he's actually working for Wesker in the next movie. Luther is. Um, if if Luther if if um, Wesker landed with a parachute near Luther, that could be like I said, it could be it could explain how they end up. But again, you win a no prize for figuring that out. Uh, Wentworth Miller did say he was like uh, the script was kind of written where the reason Chris is in jail is because when they got Wentworth Miller um, he was like uh, he plays on a show called Prison Break so his first line is I know a way out of here and that was kind of written as a joke a meta joke because he's on a show called Prison Break where he knows the way out of the prison in the first season um so yeah, again, those those are the kind of decisions Paul W. Sanderson makes, which is why I don't I don't like him as a writer or storyteller. He's a fine director. He's he gets the job done, but he's uh not a, not a writer and storyteller in my opinion. So uh so yeah, when he's like, oh, I'm gonna put Wentworth Miller in this, and then I'm gonna just have him reference his hit TV show. It's like what? So here's that song again, uh, by A Perfect Circle the remix version of The Outsider. There's Kmart. Again, I think they filmed scenes where she actually talked, but they cut them for whatever reason. Um, so they make it seem like, oh, look, there's four people at the end and all these survivors. And then in the very next movie, they open up and they kill all these people. So stupid. So stupid. So once again, Paul Anderson can't just fucking end a movie. It always has to end on some cliffhanger like it matters. And then he's then the next movie comes and he spends the first five minutes dusting all of this shit into a dustpan and dumping it in the trash and then proceeds on to the movie. So he spends the next two movies where the opening ten minutes are a waste of time. But yeah, you have Umbrella just all swarming in um, to take them, you know, take them out or whatever. And you're just like, what? Didn't they just kill Wesker? Like, what do you mean? I'm like. Puh. But then you find out in the next movie that Umbrella is now run by the Red Queen because they had to bring that story trope back. But 
that's actually not true because then in the sixth movie you find out that that Red Queen was just maybe she was a rogue version of one or not, but still Wesker and and uh, Umbrella are still in charge uh, with uh, Doctor Isaacs, whatever. So lame. But here we go. We got our cameo from Sienna coming back as Jill. The suit looks ridiculous. It's it's pretty accurate to the video game version. Um, I do love black and purple colors together. But um, but she has blonde hair here. But but why does she have blonde hair? Um. Because in the game, she has blonde hair because that device on her is is affecting the T-virus strands that are inside of her that she got when Nemesis infected her shoulder in the third video game. So Nemesis didn't infect her in the second movie. So why she has blonde hair is just, it's just like, oh, Jill just, it, it makes it feel very creepy. Because I think someone had said once, they're like, oh, Wesker made Jill dye her hair after he took control of her and it's like no he didn't he's it's it, there's no sexual aspect to wesker uh, i was surprised actually to find out in the sixth game that wesker had a kid because wesker comes across very asexual um and has does not have this like this legacy thing with him like he he he, he wanted to like rule and wipe out the world he didn't really have this like i want to pass the world on to somebody bullshit thing so that's why i was always shocked in the the sixth game when they revealed he had a kid but i'm like i guess it makes sense because before he had those aspirations he was a young man and so he probably met a woman and had a one night stand and had a kid um but wesker's dna was always kind of special and that's why he was able to resist uh oswell e spencer's brainwashing of him but again these movies don't go into that at all so we yeah we're in the end credits by the way if you haven't figured it out by now <laughs> if i if i didn't specify where we were um in the last few minutes, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the end credits have been running for a while, um, for like a, maybe a couple, 30 seconds, maybe a minute. Um, and uh, yeah, and I, I appreciate you guys being here. Like, I don't know, like, again, more costume designed by Jovovich Hawk and Denise Cronenberg. Jovovich Hawk is Mila's company. She started doing her own costume designs, starting with the second movie, Apocalypse. And then she did her own costumes in the third movie and then this one. Um, in this one, I felt like there was a little bit more fashion sense to most of the her costumes um everything seemed pretty practical like a pea coat over like a you know like i don't know what, what the material the pants were made out of but it seemed a little bit more practical in the second and third movie she had like one sleeve and it was mesh and then she had another the other sleeve was no it was sleeveless i think in the second movie she had like chaps on but they exposed her thighs as well as her like uh you know, butt and region and stuff. Like, I don't know. It's like, it, or maybe they covered her butt, but they were like reverse. Uh, th they cut, they exposed only her thighs or something. I can't remember. Is there, it, it, whatever. They're, they're, it's it's neat. They're neat clothing, but I don't know about, I don't know about uh, running around in the apocalypse during that. Uh, Mr. X Inc. That's pretty funny because Mr. X Inc. is a company that has been around for a while. Um, I don't know if they got their name from Resident Evil Two. I, th I, I think I first heard of Mr. X like in the early two thousands. But they started working on a lot of these movies, and I think they even won or were nominated for some awards for their effects of these movies. Because I think some of the people that worked on this, they designed Nemesis, and they came back to work on this one and made um, The Executioner and did some of the zombie makeup and stuff. So, uh, so yeah, really cool company, Mr. X Incorporated. Do a lot of movies. Um, and, yeah, I'm sorry. it's uh, Don't have much else to say. I mean... Like I said, because this, my favorite Res Evil characters are Chris and Claire. They're the, the Redfield siblings. I really love Code Veronica. That's my favorite game of the series. And uh, it's a shame that we, the, the, the games actually have a semi-interesting backstory. Like, uh, and, I, and I don't mean to, I'm not trying to like slam the games either. Like, there's actual lore to the games. I think a regular person would find them kind of boring. So this probably works, like these kind of movies probably work for the average person. But the main reason these movies are so dumbed down is because um, it's kind of like the Transformer movies. Like, studios started getting into it, you know, getting into their heads that they can make movies that are very basic and don't have a lot of um, cultural barriers to get through. 
um, for people to understand them in other countries. So like Transformers was one of the first ones that kind of did that in some ways where it, it had this big audience overseas. And it was because the movie was very straightforward. It was a kid who had like, you know, parents and he had a car that turned into a robot. And it was like something that no matter what culture you were from, you could wrap your head around that premise. And that's what started happening. They started taking out nuances and things like that from a lot of movies because they wanted the movies to succeed in other regions. So you kind of had to, and I'm not going to say dumb it down, but you had to, you had to simplify the cultural references um, and reduce a lot of those and reduce things from your script that that someone only in one region of the world might understand. And once they started doing that, and there you go, the Apocalypse remix of Outsider, because it was from the Resident Evil Apocalypse movie. Um, so um, so because they start taking those things out, that uh, ends up, well, you know, why these movies are just so mind-numbingly stupid and why they're written the way they are and why nothing's explained and all that stuff is because they just are they don't want to explain anything. They want the movies to be this ambiguous thing so that anyone in any country can watch it and enjoy it. And I get that. But then again, when you watch, like for us in America, when we watch movies from other countries, like I do a lot, I love subtitled movies from other countries, like French films. I'm a big fan of, uh, is that any way to treat a lady? They threw a little Easter egg in there. They did that in the first movie too with, um, uh, uh, Michelle Rodriguez. Now we're back on the menu screen, just so you guys know. Um, but yeah, I, I can't remember my thought. I was, I, of course, I lost my thought with with that distraction when I heard Mila's voice. Um, but they, you know, when when you when you take out anything uh, that needs some explanation or something like that. But like when here in America, we, I watch. I know I'm in the minority there. I know a lot of people don't watch a ton of stuff from other countries, but. I like watching movies from other countries. South Korea makes some really great horror movies. Um, I really like um, French films, a lot of French films. Uh, City of Lost Children being one of them. Like, I really love that movie. I'll watch movies with subtitles on, especially if the movie really captures my um, attention. Um, and uh, and so I feel like it's it's funny that those countries will make movies and they just do the best they can. And if, if it gets out there into the world, like the raid or other things, like if it gets out there, people will, you know, they hope it'll find an audience and they do typically those movies will find an audience. So it's just frustrating that, you know, here in America, they're like, all right, we got to make something that can't have any real nuance to it. It can't be a little thought provoking. It can't answer these questions because we need to make sure people in other countries just get that a monster showed up on screen and that's it. And they'll understand that. But if you start explaining, well, the monster is a specific parasite and this and that, people aren't going to get it. And it's like, I, I think you just have little faith in people. Yes, there is a general audience that might not care about that stuff. But I think it should still be in your movie uh, for the for the most part. Or at least fight your battles. Have one or two of, like, let's say there's six things you need to explain in your movie fight for three of them and lose the fight on the other three. That's fine. But at least fight for three of them. This movie fights for nothing, <laughs> like nothing at all, but even more so in the fifth and sixth ones, like there's still a few setups and payoffs in this movie. The next two movies are just garbage fires. And uh, I'm looking forward to getting to them and talking to them, uh, talking about them with you guys. Retribution is definitely my least favorite out of all these movies. And that's the next one up Resident Evil five it's so pathetically bad. It's just like, here's a level of a video game and here's the next level and here's the next level. It's, it's awful. I hate the fifth one. The sixth one I hate because it actually tries to tell a story, but in doing so, it can, the story kind of ruins and, and contradicts the first five movies, which on one level you're like, oh, that's okay because I don't like the first five movies, but someone does. <laughs> so the fans of these movies like the first five movies. So why shit on them by trying to tell a story in the sixth movie that just doesn't make sense or line up with anything that happened in the previous ones? I don't know. But uh, if you guys have any thoughts on these movies, especially this one, Afterlife, I'd love to hear it down below. Um, when this movie, like I said, when it was coming out, I think they were planning to do like a, a big event for it. And I tried to go, or I can't remember if I did go. I know I went to one thing um, when they started doing press for this, where I won like a prize and Ali Larder and Millie Jovich were in the room and, and Ali handed it to me. And it was a copy of, it was like a care package. I had like a little Resident Evil, uh, picture on it. And it said, uh, it had like Resident Evil five in it for the Xbox, I think 360. 
And then it had like a, a toy of the executioner in it, a t-shirt and something else, like a sticker and something. But it was really cool. Was, they were just doing fan trivia. And I asked, they asked, uh, you know, in the video games, who, uh, who, you know, in the movies, Angela Ashford is based off what video game character. And I said, um, Alexia Ashford. And I, and I got the question right. So they handed me this cool Resident Evil 5 gift package. So it was, it was cool to kind of be there and be a part of that. But then, of course, I don't really remember any of that. That's just something I found in my journal uh, because of Resident Evil, actually. I used to keep a journal um, of a lot of things, like when I w- worked on movie sets, when I worked on productions, just life stuff in general. And I had do all these different journals with pictures in them. I took uh, with, you know, regular cameras. I got them developed at Walmart or a place like that or Polaroid sometimes. And I kept a, a, a document of like five years of my life working in TV production and movies. And I'm glad I did all that because I was able to go back and read about all these things that I did, like uh, go into these events and stuff after I lost my memory. So these movies, like what's frustrating is that I connect with these movies. I try to connect to these movies more because we have a character who doesn't know who she is. She has no memories. And I was hoping rewatching these movies, I would feel something for the Alice character. And I just don't. I, I, she's such a awful, awful character played by, in, in my opinion, a very talented actress and one of the most talented actresses um, in movies in, in a lot of ways. Like, I love Mila Jovovich. She is so awesome. And it's great that she's the face of this franchise. Um, I just, I wish her actual acting abilities were used in this movie and any of these movies. Um, I think she has a scene here or there in each one, and you know, where you're like, oh, that was, she acted. She did something there. Paul let her act. And everything else, it's just like, no, just be a blank slate. Be neutral so that people in other countries can just, you know, understand your your character's motivation, which is just move, kill, move, kill. That's pretty much all she does. And that's a shame because I think they, I think Mila tried to bring something to this character every time, but then in the shooting and the editing of this movie, none of those things come across. And that's a real shame. And, uh, you know, I'm, I just it's just a bummer because I know how talented she is. And same with all these other people. It would have been nice to see Chris Redfield again in another movie after this, but we don't. We get Wesker two more times, which is nice for Wesker fans, and I'm a Wesker fan, but we get Claire one more time. We get Jill in the next movie, and for some reason we bring back uh, Michelle Rodriguez and, and uh, Oded Fair. The next movie is such a nightmare. So I'm going to stop this episode, and we'll we'll talk about the pile of shit that is Resident Evil Retribution in the next step, uh, not the very next episode, but in the next live stream, uh, or not live stream either, I guess in the next uh, pre-recorded fan commentary. Um, sorry, I've, it's been a long day and uh, now it's been a long night because it's like two in the morning and I'm just about to end this episode finally. So thank you all so much for, for watching. I appreciate it very, very much. And we'll catch you all in Raccoon City. Peace.